John, it's finals time. And the spotlight is on the NBA and the NHL, especially today on the Marshand and Oran Sports Media Podcast. And we're back. He's John Oran, the media reporter for the Sports Business Journal. I'm Andrew Marshand, sports media columnist for the New York Post. And John, let's get right to it. Who's up? Who's down? Who's up? Who's down? All right, I'll lead us off, Andrew. My who's up, and it could be a who's up really all through basketball season, but I thought Charles Barkley had a fantastic conference finals. I was listening to him at halftime on Monday night, and I just thought this exchange was was just perfect. Meantime, Jimmy Butler, first half. Give me your impressions of what he's been able to do. He's got 11. I thought he was good, but I got to say something, man. Why can you dumbass selfish make making my head hurt? Ernie, <laughs> let me tell you something. Glad I asked you about Jimmy Butler. I know, I but I, I can't let it go, man. I know, because I know. You got, if you just come to the game and say, we're just going to jack up threes, and if we win, we're going to win. If we miss them, we're going to lose. They're 4 for 21. They probably, I forget what they were in last game. 7 for 35. They, I mean, it's, it's, it's so bad to watch and play. There's no ball movement. There's no body movement. And it's just frustrating watching the team with this much talent just play stupid. It's uh, so hard to be uh, for people to be critical, but not doing hot take critical. And I just think Barkley is, is, has been able to navigate that line really, really well. And I thought that he he was able to talk about the game in a way that that sort of sort of really helped me as a viewer and informed me as a viewer watching it. And I, we're going to talk a lot more about this uh, during the topics. But for me, Charles Barkley and his performance during the Eastern Conference Finals gets him my who's up. My who's up goes to Peter Drury and NBC. Drury was in his first year as the lead play-by-play voice on the Premier League uh, for NBC, Peacock, USA Network. He replaced the excellent Arlo White, who went to live golf. Uh, Drury is a poet on the air. It's a pleasure to, to listen to him. And if you don't think announcers make things sound bigger, you have to listen to Drury as compared to some other uh, soccer play-by-players. Here's his call. This is the end of his call uh, with Everton, who was going to possibly be relegated after nearly seven decades for the first time, but they won one nothing uh, to stay uh, in the Premier League. If they had lost, they'd have to move down to basically what is AAA. Uh, it's worth $200 million to stay in the Premier League around uh, approximately. And uh, here's Drury at the end of his call. It is a grand old team to play for. It's a grand old team to support. And if you know your history... You will understand just what it means. And the thing about Peter Drury, it's not only that, that's like he's him expl- exclaiming, but it's just the, the words he uses uh, are just, it's just amazing in, in real time. Uh, and it's fun to listen to. So he gets my who's up. Uh, good job by NBC uh, hiring Drury to replace Arlo White. Congrats to you and your Everton, right? Yeah, Everton, they stay alive. Um, a chaotic scene at the end there. Fans celebrating, other fans protesting. Uh, they take it seriously uh, in Liverpool, where Everton is. Liverpool's been not as good this year, but been very good. Uh, kind of the crosstown rivals. Everton is, they're kind of like the Mets uh, of uh, English Premier League. Uh, maybe not the recent Mets. The, the Mets, the new Mets uh, with Steve Cohen uh, are kind of more like Manchester City. You want me to keep going with all these analogies of each team? <laughs> <laughs> We're doing a soccer podcast. Anyways, it was good to see Everton. It would have been sad if Everton uh, went down. Leicester City, which you might remember about four or five years ago, had one of the most amazing stories in sports history, winning the Premier League as a small team. Now they go down. They were one of the three teams to be relegated uh, to the championship, which is the you know triple-A uh, of English Premier League soccer. And so, uh, uh, but good for Everton. They stay up. I have a soft spot for Leicester City. When I lived in London, there was one American playing in the Premier League, Casey Keller, and he was the uh, keeper for Leicester City back then. Oh, nice. All right, my who's down, uh, Andrew Crane Kenny, who is the president of business for the Chicago Cubs, 
And did you see what happened over the weekend? Look, we all know Ernie Banks is Mr. Cubs, right? Mr. Cub. Yep. If there's an, a second Mr. Cub, it's probably Billy Williams. He's been around the franchise forever, a Hall of Famer, uh, well-known, he's still with the franchise, and they were giving out a Billy Williams bobblehead. Billy Williams was number 26. The bobblehead they gave out was number one. They got their Hall of Fame number wrong for the bobblehead. That would be like me not knowing that Adley Rushman is number 35, Andrew. The team apologized. The team promised all the fans that went to that game that they would eventually get uh, a Billy Williams bobblehead with the correct number. Because of uh, various issues, they're not going to be able to get it until next season, which as the Chicago Tribune said, wait till next year. Yeah, that sounds like a plan. Uh, That's tremendously bad. Uh, That's unbelievable, that story. My who's down goes to Kevin Harlan uh, with an assist to Stan Van Gundy for game six, the end of game situation, uh, which was uh, an all-timer in terms of the Derek White putback. Let's first off, listen to Celtics and the Heat game six. Uh, The Celtics didn't score. The Heat go to the finals. This is what you heard. He's got to be aware of Derek White on the quick pass back. White will inbound. It's off the smoke for the seventh game. Now, and they've been tipped in, but the buzzer sounded. The light was on. It'll be reviewed. I don't think he got that in in time. Great effort by Derek White. And didn't I say you have? Oh, they're saying on the floor they're counting it. You have to protect the offensive rebounding. Oh, he got rid of it. He sure did. That's a Celtic win, and we're going to game seven. The Celtics are going to win. There's a game seven back in Boston. All right, John, when we look at that call, uh, you need an historic call there. Okay, now I know there are some who will make excuses and say, you know, it was a bang, bang play. That's what you're paid for. Uh, And so Harlan didn't blow the call. Um, It was fine. I mean, it was okay. Uh, But that's one you really want to put your stamp on because it's a half a check stole the ball type moment. Uh, And uh, the what should have happened was you should make the call a strong call, a historic call. Pause, let the officials, which about two seconds in after a couple of ticks, they actually did make the call before the review. Then you make the call, then then you exclaim that, and then obviously there's going to be a review because the excuse is, well, everything, you know, there's never going to be a great call again because everything's reviewed, but you have to make the call. Stan Van Gundy, uh, you can't come in there and say the wrong thing. That's awful. Um, You have the layout there and Van Gundy, you got to wait for the official at that point. Then at the end, the three of them, Kevin Harlan, Stan Van Gundy and Reggie Miller are all, are all talking over each other. And we can get into this a little bit. We're going to get this into the topics, but I don't understand why Turner doesn't have uh, their top team. That's going to do the most important games work more together uh, during the season. So they have more reps uh, because This was just a situation where if you'd worked together more, you might have had a better situation uh, and better call than they had. Uh, But it starts with Harlan. He's the point guard, and uh, he didn't nail that. Um, And I get it. It's a high bar, but this is the major leagues. Uh, And I think Kevin Harlan, I think, knows. uh, He's probably thankful that the Heat won game seven. So now this call drifts into that ND Chavez, uh, you know, type of play. He had the ND Chavez for the Mets, you know, in 2015, had the catch over the wall and the Mets ended up losing, but um, it was an all time catch, uh, but kind of fades in the history because the team didn't win. So Harlan, I bet you in his heart of hearts, uh, probably is a little relieved because again, I know others have sort of said, well, it's hard. It's this, it's that. Um, This is the big leagues and you got to make that definitive call. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't make Stan Van Gundy your who's down because I thought that was the most egregious part, sort of guessing at whether and and saying saying it so authoritatively, and then you saw um, seconds later that it was wrong as well. So that I, that's that's where I I I've really found fault in that. In well, that let's song. let's discuss it. Let's make this topic one, uh, and we'll discuss this further because I also here's another thing is that the play before that. 
Uh, Harlan also had a strange call, in my opinion, uh, on the Jimmy Butler foul, um, where Jimmy Butler gets fouled. It's a chance if he makes the free throws uh, to put the heat to the NBA finals. And here's Harlan's call. and leaning in not a three so on top of that there was some confusion um in terms of you know what exactly was going on so for harlan just not look harlan's good he's not you know he's not my uh like i don't rate him as high as maybe others do because i just feel like it's interesting because he he's really known for kind of getting excited and then these big moments he chooses not to for whatever reason he goes conservative uh at least in, in these are instances and I think he's good. Like I, I like Kevin Harlan. I, I don't. I, I think he's good. I just don't know if he gives you as much around the game as others do um, in terms of just informing you and leading to the right directions um, and accuracy. I mean, accuracy matters. If you shoot a high percentage accuracy wise over the course of when you're always doing games, then in the biggest moments that shows up that you're gonna usually hit it more than than others would. I thought it was a tough tough game for uh, for Kevin Harlan. Yeah, and I thought that had the potential to be a great call because uh, the call made it seem like there was a lot of chaos uh, going on, which there was, I guess. I mean, with an official's call at the end of the game. Yeah, so let's get into the NBA because we, we're kind of here getting to the end of the year. Uh, it's the end of the year for Turner. Um, if we look at the NBA teams, uh, I think first off, um, the ABC ESPN lead play-by-play -play team with Mike Breen. Mark Jackson and Jeff Van Gundy. And we should mention false advertising here. We mentioned we were going to have Breen on this week. Uh, we were going to, uh, but his travel schedule to Denver kind of got in the way. Uh, so I hope we have Breen on in the future. Uh, but uh, but we still, because we're even-handed, even though he didn't show up for the uh, big get, <laughs> we still are going to give him praise. You know, they've been doing it a long time. And I know there's like all these broadcast teams, their people don't like that crew. I think Van Gundy might be the best game analyst going. Uh, I think Breen's excellent. Uh, and Mark Jackson, there's just great chemistry uh, at, with that trio after all these years. And I just think it feels big, uh, which is chicken and egg stuff at this point. But I also feel like you just, they know what they're doing. Like, I don't think they'd have a moment most likely um, like the Harlan crew did the other day. Yeah, and I think you pointed it out. They work all season together. So there's good chemistry, but they also have a lot of reps together so that they, they don't generally don't talk over each other during the games or when they do, it's in some uh, a kind of a banter sort of format. And they're able to banter about the games. I mean, I, I love Van Gundy's rants when he goes on on the various rants. But like you said, he's a great game analyst too. So they're able to sort of nail down, you know, what's happening during the game. I think that the ESPN game broadcast is far ahead of where, uh, where, where Turner's is. Yes. I think Turner has not, you know, I've said Ian Eagles, their best guy um, for a while. I, and I think that's true. We saw it um, when he worked with Van Gundy. We saw it when he worked with Jim Jackson uh, this playoffs. He, I think he's their best guy. I think Turner and CBS did a good job elevating Eagle to, uh, to be the final four. Uh, play by player. That, that's where, where I would go um, personally. Uh, and then when you look at the studio, uh, a lot of people, you know, malign the ESPN studio. I know um, you're, you know, it's a get up first take. I mean, basically PTI, like, I don't know, we can make up some like, <laughs> like get PTI first or something. Uh, it's something like that. There's some sort of name for it. Look, I think Stephen A has raised his game to um, a high level in terms of a, as a performer. I don't know on a national broadcast if I'm as into like him being a Nick fan, you know, as you are on like a radio show or even first take. I don't think that's necessarily the forum for that personally. Um, but, uh, you know, the show is I think when they when they put this team together, I thought, you know what, this is you're going to get solid TV. And they kind of need to be solid after the whole Maria Taylor, Rachel Nichols thing. Um, and the whole, like, you know, this, they kind of struggle to make this show something you kind of have to do at some point. You got to say, you know what, let's not worry about inside the NBA and let's just do something that's pretty good. And maybe can be really good. Yeah. I think that uh, the 
ESPN studio show is very, very good. I think it's much better than it than it has been in the past. And I think it all it starts with with Greenberg. I think Greenberg is an excellent studio host. And I I, I think that he runs the, the the show pretty well. And then you have people that give really good opinions. I mean, Stephen A. Smith, he's opinionated and he's he, he, and, he, and he he's good on television and he knows how to give opinions in a short amount of time. Uh, Michael Wilbon, I've always been a fan of. I think he, he brings sort of a historical perspective and I, he's been to going to the NBA finals for decades. Uh, so he, he knows, and Jalen Rose, I think is a, a another star in the making. Where they fall down is in the comparison to what's possibly the greatest studio show of all time. Certainly one of two with a college game day in, inside the NBA. and you know, the, it, they don't have, you know, Charles Barkley is, uh, he's a television superstar. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal is a television superstar and they also have an excellent host in, uh, in Ernie Johnson. And uh, Kenny Smith, of course, is, uh, has just been a mainstay there. And, 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 and the thing about the Turner studio show though, is that it's almost not an NBA pregame show or almost not a halftime show. It's an entertainment show, and you 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 sit down and watch, and you don't know where it's going to go, and that's not in ESPN's DNA. ESPN is going to talk about the game, and and so everything is going to be focused on the game. With with Barkley and and O'Neal and Kenny Smith, you have no idea where this is going to go, and that's part of the charm of it. But that's not what ESPN does. Yeah, Tim Kiley, who's uh, retiring, who has been inside the NBA his long time. Uh, producer. Uh, yeah, they, th that's the key is that they just kind of let them go, right? ESPN's more structured. That's how they, they are. You know, there'll be a little less that with McAfee in the middle of the day. Uh, and, you know, Stephen A can kind of do what he wants at this point. Um, but uh, when you look at it, um, that's what it is. I mean, there's not many other shows where they could have like a thing, a running bit where like you're sprinting to a screen uh, and that's like and that makes me laugh. It makes me laugh every time they do it. I've, they've done it now hundreds of times. It's fun. Probably. I mean, ultimately you're hanging. Like, I, you know, we talked about this for our pod. Like ultimately we got, we hope to make you want to hang out with us once a week and talk about media. Obviously you got to like media. I mean, that's got to be the foundation, but then it has to be an interesting enough conversation that you want to listen to us. And we obviously appreciate that, but that's what they do. It's a great hang. It's like, you don't really even necessarily have to like basketball that much they're just you know you don't know what Shaq and Barkley are gonna you know say to each other and then Ernie's a great straight man and Kenny kind of he works off them well uh and so it just it just works really well uh, overall all right before we get to Carp's, Carp's Corner, Corner uh Carp's Corner Austin Carp to go over the ratings or NBA finals let's just go quickly into the rights deals um we'll get Austin's view on what type of year uh the NBA has had but when you look at it, NBA negotiations will start in earnest towards the end of this year and into next year. Handicap it for me. Uh, so the NBA is uh, it, it's not the NFL. It's not college football, but it, it gets a good, sizable, young audience. It's uh, it, it has big name stars and it's part of like American sort of culture. So like advertisement advertisers want to be around the NBA it is going, they're going to more than double their rights fee in terms of average annual value of the rights fees. I know Apple's going to come in and try to uh, try to get everything and Amazon's going to try to get it sort of as much as they can. The NBA, I, it's unthinkable to me that they're going to leave broadcast television. So I think- I, I, they're, 100%. They're, I think ESPN, Disney, Iger, Pataro, Burke Magnus and Silver and all them, I think they're kind of all on the same page, I believe. Yeah, and so I, ES, I see ESPN keeping uh, keeping th their position. You know, maybe they'll give up uh, like a one of one of the weeknight uh, series yep. to a streamer or something along those lines. Uh, but the finals will be on uh, ABC. I wouldn't be surprised if they got a, a couple of the other big, you know, like an All Star game or something. Uh, to go over uh, with, with ESPN or, or ABC as well. Because Nick Khan said that on our podcast. So that's just right into your head. 
right. I don't know if that's happening. Nick Khan might. Uh, that's, that's that's me right there. I also think that the, the the NBA they want to do more than test streamers. I mean, the people have already been test testing the streamers. They see what Amazon did with Thursday Night Football, which uh, you know wasn't as big an audience certainly as television, but it felt big. It was a big production, and they were able to get a lot of viewers for the biggest games there. So I can see somebody be it Amazon, uh, Apple p- potentially, uh, or you know maybe even at some point Netflix is gonna is gonna get involved in in sports as well. If I were gonna handicap it, I would think Amazon is the, the best positioned to come in and 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 get a package there. Then the wild card to me is NBC. I guess Fox, Lachlan Murdoch had said that they're unlikely uh, to bid. I mean they're they're there for the price. As an unlikely down. meaning you're not doing it. Yeah, basically. Right? Yeah, I mean, because uh, the NBA wants you in there. Correct. That's true. Dire- I think that's directionally accurate that they're not going to be involved. NBC uh, does want the NBA. Uh, the question is whether the, uh, the NBA wants to go to NBC and to Peacock as well, or whether they want to get a, you know some other streamer that 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 is able to uh, uh, aggregate a bigger audience. All right, John. Let's end our NBA discussion with. Corpse Corner. Corpse Corner. Austin Carp, Sports Business Journal, ratings guru. All right, Austin, when you look at this NBA final, Nuggets, Heat, we've talked about it. Everyone's talking about I don't know why everyone cares so much about ratings, but you do. If anybody cares about ratings, it's you. Uh, when you look at it, if you're going to put an over-under on the ratings for this series, what would you put it at? You know, I'm going to put the line at around 10.7 million viewers. That's under what Celtics and Warriors do last year. I mean, Warriors are just the Warriors. You saw that as evidenced by this year's numbers and how they were able to really, combine with the Lakers, carry a lot of those early rounds. And without you know the Celtics now, I don't think you're gonna get that big of a number. But I do think you're gonna stay well ahead of 2021 and 2020, those pandemic influence years. And I definitely think you're gonna stay ahead of some of those Tim Duncan led Spurs series that were either sweeps or five games. Those were well under 10 million viewers. So John, you got the over or the under, John? Oh, I'm going under. I'm going I, I, under. I, uh, I'm, I'm taking the under on that. How about you, Andrew? Well, actually, I had 10.7 in mind. So I'll go, I'm going to go 10.71 and I'm going to take the over <laughs> just to be on the opposite side of Orion. But I thought about 10.7 as well as I studied the numbers previously. Um, see what the actual retail value is, though, on that one. <laughs> All right. So uh, I have a what if question. I, you, you put the over under at 10.7. What if? the Celtics had, had won, and this was a Celtics Nuggets, where where do you, where, where would you have put the number then? I would have gone a little higher. I mean, this that Boston market just brings a little more the, to the table than I think the Miami-Fort Lauderdale market does. And also, you, you do have to consider, and while it's not an incredible draw, the Florida Panthers are also in the Stanley Cup final at the same time. So it's kind of taking away just that little bit of mind share in the South Florida market. But Boston is one of the top NBA markets in the country. It would have drawn just a little more. I maybe would have even gone over 11 million viewers on that average had Boston won. Another what if question. We were almost with LeBron James and the Lakers against the Celtics, Lakers, Celtics. What would your over under had been with that? Oh, I mean, I, I, I would have been gangbusters. I would have predicted over 14, 15 million viewers, well over last year. This may be LeBron's last shot combined with what you just said, that Lakers-Celtics rivalry. I would have definitely shot the moon, shot the moon on that one. All right, last thing, and we're going to have you back in a minute with the NHL, uh, with the Stanley Cup Finals. But when you look at this, if you do a little summary of how this season has gone, this is sort of, as we said earlier, it's sort of uh, the junior year of high school trying to get into college uh, in terms of the NBA deals. So this is their last kind of chance because uh, they, towards the end of this year and into next year, they'll really negotiate. And so this is their final. How would you say they've done in terms of this year uh, to mm-hmm. say, you know what, we're really popular and you should give us billions and billions to ESPN, Warner Brothers, Discovery, Amazon, Apple, et cetera. You know, the regular season was down a little bit, but what it showed is that the program does continue, all NBA programming, continues to deliver stability in their games. And then when they got into the playoffs, it had just been, it's been nuts with the numbers. I mean, heading into the finals, you're probably looking at the best postseason for the NBA across TNT and ESPN and ABC since 2012. Okay, so even if, you, with this, even with this Heat Nuggets final, I think they're kind of playing with house money. 
And you saw that with ESPN's release. I mean, as soon as that sweep was over for Lakers Nuggets, they put out a release saying, saying it was their best uh, playoffs since 2012. That sweep was 17% higher than what Mavericks Warriors drew last year for the Western Conference Final. So LeBron and Steph and the Warriors, they were that much of a draw earlier on. So I do think that the NBA right now is playing with house money in terms of the viewership for this postseason and heads into their media rights talks in a really good spot. So they got like a 1,500 on the SATs, John. It's <laughs> good analogy. I think it's supposed to be a 1,600 on the SATs. But now they don't. Now you don't have to give your SATs, which would have been good for me. <laughs> I would have made, I think a, yeah, Why couldn't they have done that when we were in school, Andrew? Exactly. You went to Maryland. It's a pretty good school. Uh, well, right, thanks, Austin. Thanks. Okay, well, it's not only the NBA, Andrew. There's a uh, hockey also is in there. Stanley Cup Finals. It's going to be Florida versus Las Vegas. And for the purposes of this podcast, it is going to be the first uh, Stanley Cup final that is going to be all on cable. Turner has the rights. All the games are going to be on TNT. I believe Crew TV is going to simulcast uh, uh, all the games as well. TBS is going to simulcast most of them. So they're going to be able to, uh, they're hoping to aggregate a bigger audience uh, that way, as opposed to just having it on TNT. Uh, but it's it's going to be the first one not on broadcast, which means that the numbers almost certainly are going to be coming down a little bit in terms of the television ratings. Yeah, this is a Jeff Zucker deal uh, that he made before uh, he exited. Now they're WBD Sports. What was it called back then? I believe just Turner Sports, right? Or is... Oh, just Turner Sports. Okay. Yeah. So just Turner Sports. Uh, you have Kenny Albert on the play-by-play. Kenny does a really strong job. Uh, does Rangers radio. I mean, think about that. He does Rangers radio and then he's doing the, uh, doesn't even do it. The team still have Sam Rosen here in New York uh, doing MSG network, a Rangers game and Kenny Albert. He, he's done the finals before uh, in plays of Doc Emmerich, uh, but uh, but be Albert uh, on the play by play. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't think the numbers will be uh, that tremendous uh, because of the cable factor and also because of the matchup factor. We're bringing back a, a second Carp's Corner in one uh, podcast, Andrew. Carp's, Carps Corner. Corner. Two and one. Uh, Two and one. Uh, we want you to talk about the NHL, which, uh, of course, has two non-traditional teams here in, in uh, Las Vegas and Florida. And also, for the first time, it's going to be on TNT. If we're looking at television ratings, Austin, this seems like death to me. For the Stanley Cup final in particular, yeah, I, I, it's going to be down. The games were on ABC last year in year one of this new media rights pact, moving completely to cable now. So I think that's to be expected. You had a six-game series last year. Benefit, you do have two U.S. teams here again, so that does help out Warner Brothers' discovery a little bit. I'm curious, very curious, and I think they will stay above the 2021 and 2020 Stanley Cup final, which were on a combination of NBC and NBCSN at the time. I still, there, I still think there's enough momentum that they've had from some of the earlier rounds to stay above that number. There's intrigue, I think, around Vegas. Uh, Florida, okay, maybe not so much, but I do think there's a little bit of a Golden Knights following out there that can keep them above those years. What was that number for NBC and NBCSN a couple of years ago? I was around two and a half million viewers. It was a little later in the season. Everything was kind of pushed back with the calendar. I do think that Golden Knights, Panthers stays above that. I'm guessing more, just under three million, probably around 2.8 million is what I'm going to put the line at for that one. John, over under, uh, what do you got? Austin's, Austin is bullish on this, over under. I'm, I'm going under on, on that. By under on 2.8. I just think the exclusive to cable, uh, cable TV, exclusive to TNT is, is going to hurt that number. John doesn't know how to, this is how you make the sources. I'm going to go over because then they think, oh, Marsha, very positive. <laughs> Said the nice things about Harlan and, and Stan Van Gundy earlier for Turner. Oh, wait, going over will help my sources? I want to go over then. I want to go over. Well, you're kind of positive. You're negative. You're like, you know, you got thumbs down all the time. I said, you know what? I think it's going to be over. 2.8 is not exactly uh, a huge number. I'm going to go over. I'm going to go 3.27. Book that, please, Chris Mason. Master the board for when it's exactly 3.27. And it's a big deal for the NHL because they're heading into the cup final where numbers are kind of about even with last year than the first year of that deal. I think the Stanley Cup final, though, is probably going to put him down a little bit for the season, for the postseason. Austin, thanks a ton for joining us again. Another excellent 
Corpse Corner. Corpse Corner. Love hearing it. Love hearing it. All right, a couple of quick topics. Uh, this topic uh, probably shouldn't be picked, but a friend of the podcast, Michael Nathanson of Moffat Nathanson, had a total change of heart uh, about the future of, of media and streaming. Uh, Michael's always been the one to talk about uh, Fox and ESPN and their strategies for not taking their programming and putting it on a, on a streaming service. So if, if you want to watch uh, something on ESPN, it's, it's very, very rarely simulcast on ESPN+. Plus. Uh, and and uh, the, the, the same with Fox and, and, and Tubi. The other side of the strategy is CBS, which, you know, puts all their NFL games on, on Paramount Plus or NBC, which simulcasts almost everything onto, onto Peacock as well. Well, they had a, uh, Moffat Nathanson had a big media conference recently, brought in people like Brian Roberts and, and uh, charter CEO, Chris Winfrey. And Michael Nathanson afterwards was like, the NBC and Peacock and CBS and Paramount Plus, they're not being punished by, the, by cable operators or satellite distributors for, for spilling over that programming or by sharing the programming on their, uh, on their streaming services. And he was like, so th- you should expect more of these networks, including potentially ESPN and Fox, to start streaming a lot of, a lot of their things. He had brought, they had Brian Roberts at this conference and they asked if about Peacock getting exclusive access to a wild card playoff game with the NFL. And they asked him whether he, they thought that would accelerate cord cutting. And Brian Roberts talked about broadband subscribers and how it's gonna help Comcast ultimately because of that. So it has almost nothing to do with video. Charter, uh, Charter CEO, Chris Winfrey, you know, they asked him about sort of, uh, the whole idea of cord cutting and he said, look, the programmers, they just killed their own golden goose. They had a YouTube CEO, Neil Mohan, in there. And he just kind of talked about like their, their bundle, irrespective of, of this, the streaming that's out there. And so the upshot of this is Michael Nathanson was surprised. And I am surprised that Brian Roberts and Chris Winfrey and, and Neil Mohan are not saying, OK, if you give away the programming, I'm not paying for it for, the, for my video uh, bundle. They, they're continuing to pay for it, and uh, and you're going to see a lot more leakage going on. And the upshot of that, by the way, is that the cord cutting number, where the floor is, uh, Nathanson had it at like 50 to 60 million. Yeah, he has it right he here. Did. He said, this in turn will diminish the value of the linear bundle, accelerate cord cutting, and call into question our thesis of a 50 to 60 million household U.S. pay TV floor. That's that- kind of... You're giving to me every quote. From, say, you quote every uh, every uh, executive in the at this conference. To me, that's the headline, John. T- totally. And if Nathanson's saying that, because he's always been the one saying, like, there's going to be a floor. People like me, I just want a one-stop shop to get everything. So you're so, he, so you're saying, I mean, that's basically no ESPN DTC though. Is that in our conversation with this or no? That doesn't play into this uh, really much at all. Uh, ESPN does have uh, deals with all the distributors that would allow it to go direct to consumer. The question is, when the, uh, as always, when will they do that? How you saying they're going to leak will... some of the stuff on ESPN Plus. So maybe if you can get, um, this isn't necessarily real, but whatever, the NBA on ESPN Plus, that maybe you like the NBA, you get ESPN Plus and you cut the cord and that's going to diminish cable. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, you don't need to see everything there. Uh, the Almost every single ESPN programming deal allows them, uh, gives them the rights to stream the games. I don't think that re- I, I don't th- think it has to do with um, uh, the NBA or the NFL, uh, but but certainly like their college football deals. Like, mm. you, like if you want to see these games, you can easily you know, g- g- eventually. You can't do it now. But what Nathanson's saying is, why wouldn't ESPN start to simulcast a lot of this on on ESPN Plus because it's everybody else is doing it. Nobody's getting hurt from it. Yeah. So what's the floor? That's the question I want to know. That is that is the question. We have to have Michael uh, Nathanson back on. Find yeah. Out the 50 to 60 million is no longer the floor. What, what would that be? 30 to 40 million? All right. Let's move to what. Well, this is what's crushing our next topic uh, as we finish up here. RSNs and the cutting of the cords um, and Diamond Sports. This has been a big story 
uh, on the pod that we've talked about a lot. What can you tell us uh, in terms of where you think things are going? Here's one thing about Diamond Sports is ever since they've gone into bankruptcy, they have made every single payment uh, that that uh, by contract they've been been due to make. And part of the reason that they've done that is because they they want us to keep baseball at the table and work out a deal to where baseball uh, and and the teams that they have the rights to give them streaming rights so that they have they have their own direct to consumer product and they want to be able to to make that a little bit ro- more robust. None of the baseball teams have been sort of have been playing with a, a, a diamond and uh, and relinquishing those rights. Why would they? Do they want Diamond to fail? I mean, I, wouldn't you want to be partners with one of these big digital players like Apple, Amazon, or Disney uh, instead of Sinclair? Yes, but you need all the rights to do that. And Diamond already has a bunch of the rights. They can, they can't just take those those rights away from Diamond. And so the Diamond's argument to baseball is that you know we're your best avenue forward. That's our argument with the NBA as well. Like if you want to move forward in the regional uh, area, it works. It's better to work together. Anyway, the reason I'm putting, I'm, I'm discussing this is right, right around as this pod publishes, uh, the Padres are, are up. And at some point, Diamond's going to say like, well, if baseball is not going to come to the table, you know, we're, we're not going to pay, you know, for, uh, for contracts that don't make money. And the Padres that's a very team friendly contract that, that, that they have. But this so, sounds like a terrible marriage. Like it does to me, it like doesn't work in the end when this is how you're trying to work together. Like just the kind the goals don't seem common. And it just feels like you're headed for divorce in some manner. I mean, that's just what I'm hearing as you talk about it and you pay much closer attention to this issue than, than I do. But in terms of if, they, if there's so much friction to try to go forward together I just don't think it works long term. I think that what they'll, what they'll say is like we could have a loveless marriage, and and it, it will pay it will pay these teams a lot of money that they're used to getting, you know. So let's just kind of move forward that way. And I think what baseball wants to do is is take those rights back. But there's a big problem with that because in your market, the Yankees are, are not are not part of that. You know, they're not going to give their rights away. In my market. The Orioles or the the, the Nationals so that that's an independent uh, RSN that's down there. Like they're they're going to be loath to give their rights back to, to MLB. So well, there, there there are no good solutions moving forward. Well, I saw pictures from your daughter's graduation. You are definitely not in a loveless marriage. I saw love <laughs> in the air, love in your wife's eyes. Very happy uh, to be married to John O'Ran. All right, last thing: sports business awards. Uh, Sports Business Journal Awards, uh, big day for Fox. Big day for SBJ. John Hamm shows up. Uh, we gave yep. the Lifetime Achievement Award to uh, to Gary Bettman and John Hamm. ran too it. big, too big for the Sports Business Journal Awards does not show up. John Hamm does. <laughs> but the, uh, the the big news in, in the media circles is uh, Executive of the Year for all of sports uh, business uh, went to Eric Shanks. Uh, Fox also won... Um, for a media company of the year. And it w- was just because Fox ended up uh, for, for the year, you know, they had the Super Bowl, the World Cup, the World Series, and they uh, put in uh, totally new booths for the Super Bowl and for the World Series. And they en- engineered probably one of, one of the most unique deals I've ever covered with the Big 10 and ki- kind of, kind of uh, getting those rights done. It was a really big, good year for Fox, and uh, that's that's the primary reason why they sort of ran the uh, the media categories. Well, there they go. Congratulations to Shanks and company at Fox Sports. We did also have Eric Shanks on. Um, I have nothing to do with the voting, by the way. Uh, we did have Eric Shanks on right before the Super Bowl when Fox had it. That's a good episode, I guess, around early February, if you go back into the archives, uh, if you want to hear Shanks' full view on the world of sports including Tom Brady, the Mando effect, Andrew. That's what they do. No, that's good. <laughs> get your executives on and get the Mando effect. You highlighted my week where I was up in Worcester, Massachusetts for my daughter's uh, graduation. Great time. Uh, 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 but you were somewhere on, was it Saturday night or Sunday night? Friday, last Friday night. I was at Taylor Swift. You're a Swifty. I'm Who a knew? Swifty. 
Uh, you know, my daughter's friend, she won the lottery. So we got tickets. I mean, still a lot, but not a thousand dollars, not even close to it. Uh, in the 200 range, they're pretty good seats too. So she's, we won the lottery, drove down to the Meadowlands. Uh, and, and look, I'm not, I, I like some of her songs, but um, I will say when she said she's going to have a special guest uh, come on and she said the guy was from New Jersey. Uh, so she, and I, I started yelling out, Bruce! Bruce is <laughs> representing sports traders everywhere. Uh, but I forgot the guy's name. He's very famous. This is the songwriter. She writes uh, one of her songs with he's from New Jersey. That's who it was. It wasn't Bruce Springsteen. Uh, so uh, as a sport, I've never seen Bruce Springsteen, but now I've seen in person. So I don't know if I'm actually a sports writer, uh, but uh, I do like him. But uh, yeah, she was good. I, it's a spectacle. It's a spectacle. It was, it was very good. The, it was very uh, good. The, the lines for the men's bathroom at her, con con uh, at her oh. concert. Are, tremendous yeah it's tremendous you just walk right in there i could go to the bathroom whenever like food you know i went during songs like you know everyone's trying to get the food before i said wait i'll wait you know i can miss the song um and no food lines it was that was tremendous but you listen it's it's interesting you just see the passion people have uh and like kind of it's kind of like sports you know they want to believe in something on uh, these people men and women mostly women but the men too uh, believe in taylor swift i mean she is mm -hmm. loved they, at one point though i will say seventy thousand people there a lot of this has them undercovered i'm surprised but they were chanting i think i mean i don't know a, at least a lot of people some people might have been doing saying taylor but clicker clicker <laughs> some people heard taylor 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 i heard clicker click i off my hat a little bit a couple of people probably are doing taylor as well but anyways good time you know what this this podcast really has taken off who who knew who knew <laughs> Seventy thousand people it might have been taylor i don't know uh, she even seemed busy though i thought you know <laughs> i did actually hear one swifty this is a true story right next to me swifty just said the girl looked i'd say she was 17 18 i just met dave portnoy she's on the phone talking to somebody else i just met dave portnoy so Swifties also like Barstool because wow. she was so excited. And really? She did not know. She did not. She apparently does not listen to the Mando podcast or at least watch on YouTube because she had <laughs> no idea. It was me. No idea. Anyways, if you, we got to thank Chris Mason, always master of the board. AC Wyatt puts everything together. Uh, and get greatest. Uh, that helps us. You put the stars on there. Nice reviews. Helpful. And if you can uh, follow, uh, then you get the podcast. Just download it every Wednesday. Uh, it comes out around 6 a.m. every Wednesday morning. Hey, are, are you going to give a special shout out to next week? I'm missing next week's podcast because my, my other daughter is graduating from high school. Yeah, John's missing next week. First one, his Cal Ripken streak of never missing a Mando podcast comes to an end. Replacing him uh, is Colin Cowherd. So that should be fun. We'll be with the herd in the Mando podcast. Uh, we have him signed up for next week. Colin Cowherd, special guest host. I'm going to have my son Google Wally Pip. <laughs> there you go. I don't <laughs> know if we can afford Cowherd. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for listening. And that, sorry, to do that again. Sorry. A lot. It's it's one line. It's it's a big one. I know. I know. Oh my god. Why am I forgetting Reggie's? I almost said Reggie Taylor. Reggie. Reggie uh, Miller. Reggie Miller. Three. Taylor Swift's on your mind. Yeah, uh, that's exactly it. The much maligned. I just did it again. Reggie Miller. Thank you. I will say it does sound better when your mic goes mute. The show. They are the. It is the Everton Blues, right? They call them the Blues. Actually. Not really, no, I don't Not think really. so. Can you, can you edit out where I say blues? Nobody leaves this place without singing the blues. <laughs>